heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the reality of artificial intelligence. Its disruption hits hiring, it hits business models and more. We're going to discuss it all with Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak later this hour. And we'll sit down with the CEO of Uber as the ride-sharing company posts solid earnings on strong demand for rides and deliveries. Plus, we'll speak with the CEO of SoFi amid the banking system turmoil as the personal finance company partners with travel giant Expedia to create a rewards program for its customers. But first, let's dig in on these markets because we're nervous. We're worried once again. We're focusing on the Federal Reserve tomorrow. What does that mean for the macro? What does that mean for interest rates? What does it mean for the banking system that we are ultimately really panicking about on the day? We're off by 1.5% on the Nasdaq. But the KBW Bank Index falling hard, off by 4.8%. Basically, every single member, particularly in the smaller lender sphere, are on the downside. The ripple and repercussions coming from First Republic still being digested as we worry about really the strength of the financial system here at the moment. The two-year yield, therefore, absolutely spiralling lower in terms of our borrowing costs, down 18, 19 basis points on the day. We are searching for safety ahead of the Federal Reserve. But where we're not searching for safety, where we're looking for risk assets, is in Bitcoin. Moving on, maybe this actually is also linked to the banking turmoil, the worry about really the solidity of your normal financial system. We're up more than 3%. We're back at 28,500. So remember, Ed, we have come back from that 30,000 level to a certain extent. But dig into the micro. Yeah, there's, the ripple effects are there. There's very few movers to the upside in the technology sector. I have found two NXP Semiconductor, one of the main chip suppliers of the automotive industry. Strong earnings in the quarter gone, solid outlook, up 3%, one of the best performing stocks on the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. Amazon, pretty much the only mega cap in the green this Tuesday. You mentioned crypto. That is supporting crypto-related stocks like Coinbase, higher by 8 tenths of a percent. It had been significantly higher after the company announced an international derivatives exchange for institutional investors. That is tensions with U.S. regulators on, are ongoing. PacWest down 26%. Western Alliance, another banking, regional banking name that is lower. We continue to track that contagion risk. The main earnings mover is certainly Uber. We're looking at the biggest jump since around November. You look at adjusted EBITDA outperforming in the quarter gong, strong outlook for adjusted EBITDA in the second quarter. Gross booking slightly below estimates, but there's strengths in riding and strength in delivery. And we will get into that, Emily, later in the show. Lyft modestly higher, had been lower uh, on some of the outperformance by Uber because, of course, they're so closely linked as market competitors. Let's just for a moment, Ed, though, talk about one particular company that you didn't mention in the micro. We're going to talk about ChatGPT, how it's upending the ed tech industry. It seems to be a concern in particular for Chegg. Absolutely extraordinary move for this online education company, down more than 50% at one point. It's following the company, warning that chatbot tool is really threatening its homework help services. Chegg CEO says they've noticed a, quote, significant spike in student interest in ChatGPT since March, which is impacting their new customer growth rate. So what does AI and education look like going forward? How do they harness each other? How does it upend each other? Let's dig into the impact of generative AI in particular on ed tech space. Hadi Patovi is with us. He's CEO of Code.org. It's an ed tech nonprofit which just launched Teach AI, along with Khan Academy, the World Economic Forum and others. Teach AI is, look, an initiative dedicated to helping educators teach with AI about AI. But Hadi, how much already is AI teaching kids instead of teachers? I don't know about the AI teaching kids instead of teachers, but what every parent, every school student and teacher recognizes is that since the moment that ChatGPT and these chatbots came out, kids are wondering, can I use this for homework? Teachers are wondering, how do I need to adjust my classroom now that this technology is out there? And you know, one of the best questions, when I show this to my kids, mm -hmm. he also asked, am I allowed to use this for school? But then he also asked, what's the point of school if this can do all this stuff? Well, precisely. Uh, right. And so these are questions that nobody has firm answers to. And part of the issue is that the technology creators aren't saying how schools should be using it. And school leaders are just receiving this technologies coming out, wondering how do we react? And it's moving so fast. The goal of Teach AI is to bring together 
tech leaders such as OpenAI, Microsoft, and Amazon who are creating these technologies together with education leaders such as Code.org, Khan Academy, the College Board, and then global education leaders all across this country and on all six continents to answer these questions about how should education evolve for an age of AI. I I mean, will this erode many a business model? You're currently looking at incorporating AI curriculum, you say, and tools into your platform to reach 150 million students by 2030. But what is education? Prophesize for us. What is education going to look like by 2030? Will they really be using online tools? Well, one thing I could say is the current education system we use where students spend most of their time reading in books and sort of filling their heads with knowledge from books was designed based on the invention of the printing press 600 years ago. And so we need to th rethink how we do education in a time when information is available at your fingertips and AI can synthesize and, and create for you. And so our goal isn't just to get students who know how to memorize a lot of information and practice repetitive rote tasks, but helping students become creators and problem solvers using AI as a superpower. Yeah, are you on the side that AI augments? rather than competes against? Or are you already thinking, wow, education is going to have to so pivot because the job market is going to so have to pivot? I think both of those are, are true. AI absolutely augments, but we need to teach students not just the skills of the past, but also the skills of the future. Every workplace is asking its, its workers, figure out how this can make you more productive. Whereas today, many schools are banning AI because it's considered mm. cheating. The, the cheating that people are trying to stop in schools is what employers want their employees to do. They're like, oh, if this makes you work faster, please do it, if it, if it reduces the time spent on any kind of task. Hadi, does Code.org, good morning, by the way, have any sort of granular insight into how students, either at the high school level or college level, are actually using generative AI tools? Uh, this, how they're using it, it's much broader than what Code.org sees. And, Honestly, the best way to see that is what is listening to parents, students, and teachers. Uh, and it's much more anecdotal. You know, for, as one example, my neighbor's daughter just got an F on a homework assignment because the teacher accused her of using ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. And she's insisting, I didn't use it, I wrote it myself. Uh, and that's a kind of story that's happening all around the world. Uh, it's not easy to keep track of because, first of all, students, when they use these tools, they use them at home and they also know to change up the writing and to personalize it as well. Uh, but the real issue we need to talk about is not to view using of new technology as cheating, but to figure out how do we move the goalposts of education, how do we teach creativity, communication skills, problem solving skills, and technological fluency so students learn the stuff that we want them to learn, including how to use these tools to be more productive. So in Chegg's case, their shares are, are plunging because they gave evidence that their offering is being displaced by ChatGPT. It's a free service, principally, that anyone can access as long as they, they get past the wait list. Is that what you're seeing, that generative AI tools are displacing traditional online education tools? What's definitely true is that tools like ChatGPT can help a student do almost all of what their current homework looks like today. And so once that's out there, Students wonder, can I use this for my homework? And of course, teachers, classrooms, schools wonder, how do we change what homework is? Because what's the point if a student just plugs it in and gets an answer and doesn't actually use their heads and their brains very much? And so there's going to be great disruption within education technology and also in classrooms as we rethink not only the tools for education, but even how teaching is done and even the purpose of education. You've been in the for-profit side, starting your career at Microsoft and other tech giants, and then when you're now in a non-profit focus, how much are you talking with government? How much are you thinking about the ethical repercussions of where artificial intelligence is leading us, whether it be from children, whether it be more broadly about the way in which we use it as humankind and what it ultimately means for all of us and our productivity? That is a fantastic question. It's the purpose of what we're announcing today with Teach AI, which is to bring together for-profit and private corporate leaders, basically the technology creators, with the education leaders, many of which are basically governments, to have this dialogue to figure out how to safely and ethically and equitably integrate AI. And in not the put it back in its box. You don't right. think we should slow down? Yeah, there's two the extremes, which is just 
release the technology, see what happens, and the other extreme is ban it, slow it down, stop it. The middle ground is to figure out how do we use it and harness it, but with safety and, and ethics as part of that conversation. And that's why we're bringing together not only tech leaders and education leaders, but government leaders. There's numerous ministries from around the world, ministries of education that are participating in this work because they want to basically be at the forefront of how we change education. For good, hopefully, code.com. Code.org, in fact, CEO Hadi Patovi. We thank you so much for being with us. Meanwhile, Ed, more on the global sphere right now. Yeah, Infineon Technologies breaking ground on a 5 billion euros new chip factory in Dresden, Germany. As part of its largest investment in chips, the German company is aiming to get another billion euros worth of funding from the European Union as the bloc seeks to double European chip output by 2030. CEO Jochen Hannebach also spoke about the Chips Act and self-reliance in the semiconductor industry. Have a listen. I would uh, appreciate some alignment in the liberal democratic world on, on the CHIPS Act. Um, I think um, uh, no country will achieve self-sufficiency. It's all about reducing one-sided dependencies. Uh, and, and therefore, some alignment would uh, be for the better good of uh, the whole industry and uh, the economy. Coming up, Uber out with earnings that top testaments. We sit down with Uber's CEO, Dara Khosrowshahi, next. This is Bloomberg. On a day where tech stocks are on the downside, there's a significant outperformer we've got to turn our attention to, Uber up with earnings and absolutely rocketing in terms of its share price. Best day since November, revenue beat, record profitability for the company, free cash flow as well. And they even promise that they're going to be expanding profitability, Ed, into the second quarter. All of this, though, as monthly active users are actually perhaps a little less than expected, but those users, they are active. They're riding more. We're ordering yep. more. Freight, a little bit of weakness. But look, I took a, a drive from the airport yesterday, and when I checked out Lyft versus Uber, Uber still has a lower price point. But that's the interesting thing, isn't it, at the moment, Ed, as to how much the competition, the focus on prices, that coming down, whether that will ultimately impact some of the business models out there. For now, Uber really managing to show its prowess post its earnings. Ed. Yeah, look, we're, we're judging Uber on an adjusted EBITDA basis. Strong in the quarter gong, strong outlook going into the second quarter, 800 to 800 and $50 million above what the street was looking for. They had that 2024 20, goal when it comes to adjusted EBITDA coming up. We welcome our Bloomberg TV and radio audiences worldwide. Joining us now, the CEO of Uber, Dara Khosrowshahi, and of course, Emily Chang of Bloomberg News here with me. Em, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, and Dara, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Obviously, we're seeing strong reaction in the stock today, strong on mobility, strong on delivery. I want to focus on delivery first because that's more discretionary, and obviously, times are tough right now. People are being more picky about what they spend on. Are you expecting any pullback in delivery in particular? Why or why not? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's great to be here, and obviously, it's great to be here within the context of super strong results overall for Uber. As it relates to our delivery growth, we saw really solid growth uh, this last quarter in terms of cost and currency growing about 12% our gross bookings on a year on year basis. And we're seeing the habit of frequency, for example, frequency for delivery uh, consumers was up on a year on year basis, basket size continues to be higher. And we actually saw our gross bookings growth accelerate from Jan to Feb to March. So we expect Q2 delivery growth to be higher than what it was in Q1. So we're not seeing any kind of a signal at this point of a slowdown. And while there may be a slowdown going on in terms of the economy, I think generally the consumer remains strong. Generally the consumer is spending more money on experiences. And I think food is a part of that experience set. And we as a company, because of our global scale and size and our brand, and our tech prowess, so to speak, are generally going faster than, than the delivery category. I think if you put that all together along with profitable growth, you get to good outcomes regardless of the environment. All right. Lyft has a new CEO. They've made it clear they're going to lean into lower prices to compete. They want to claw back market share. What's the risk of a price war? 
Well, you never know, and you can't predict the future, but from what we have seen in terms of the statements coming out from Lyft is that they want to compete based on competitive pricing. And what we're seeing in the marketplace, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning, which is Uber pricing is quite competitive in the, in the marketplace. And I think if you have Uber and Lyft competing not on who can have the lowest price, but who's got the best experience, who's got the best brand, who's got the better reliability, or breadth of products out there, I think that you know we can both do fine in this marketplace. The fact is that the mobility marketplace is growing. Uh, people are going out more, they're going to restaurants, they're returning to work, they're returning to the office. We are definitely seeing those tailwinds. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if Lyft does too going forward. Welcome to our Bloomberg radio and television audiences worldwide. We're with the CEO of Uber, Dara Khosrowshahi. Dara, on that, outlook on consumer strength, how long does it last? I mean, are you seeing any price pressure on the consumer or any sort of granular data you can give about how you see the rest of the year? We're not seeing any kind of uh, pressure as it relates to consumer spend at this point. Uh, and I think part of it is because of our supply situation and generally supply in the marketplace getting better. We are seeing drivers talk about inflation more, and about 70% of drivers who are coming onto the platform have said that uh, inflation, the affordability of groceries, et cetera, has played a part in their decision to come onto the platform and to join Uber in order to augment their earnings or just bring in you know, a healthy earnings set as it relates to uh, the marketplace right now. We are seeing some signs on the enterprise side of of weakness in terms of pickup, for example, of Uber for Business. So when we look at Uber for Business, new client signings, they're a bit slower than what they were pacing before. So I think you're seeing in the environment, companies are being more careful. They are cutting costs, often they're kind of cutting personnel, but that weakness has definitely not translated into the consumer. And the consumer we see being very strong and we don't see any signal of weakness there at all. The other enterprise facing business is freight, which you fund separately. But what metrics would guide a timeline to sell or spin off Uber Freight, Dara? Well, at this point, the focus for freight is to really operate the business in an, op uh, in an optimal way. Um, right now, the freight brokerage business and the transportation business is readjusting pricing significantly. Prices were sky high two years ago. They have come down. Uh, significantly for two years now. And I think what we're going to see is essentially pricing bottoming out sometime in the next couple of months. As we see that pricing bottoming out, then we can get in a position to grow our freight business, um, use our digital acumen and the data advantage that we have in order to provide a better service for shippers and to be the be best platform for truckers out there. That's really the focus of freight right now. Ultimately, we will look to optimize whether freight's inside of Uber, or outside of Uber, et cetera, to maximize shareholder value. That's what we're here for. But today, the focus is on building the best digital freight business that we can. Tens of thousands of folks have been laid off across the tech industry, Dara. You've continued to say no company-wide layoffs, but you have done some more targeted layoffs. You've done some performance-related cuts. How are you thinking about headcount right now? And are you considering potentially a broader riff if things continue to get worse, you know, looking across the broader landscape? Well, I, I just don't think that companies should all of a sudden get discipline about headcount because they have to. I think that you've got to have discipline on headcount and cost as a continuing way that you operate going forward daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. And you've seen that discipline for us. So if you look at our headcount growth from call it 2019 to where we are now for the base business, for our uh, mobility and delivery business, total headcount growth over that period is up about 10% versus uh, bookings growth that is approaching 70%. So we have always been very disciplined in terms of how we manage costs. We talked about this year, even though we're showing huge top line growth and huge profitability growth. We're not letting go of that discipline and we're saying that headcount's gonna be flatted down. And I think that kind of discipline and the rhythm allows the company to focus on executing, on innovating, 
and not looking around, you know, over your shoulder as to whether you're going to be one of those people who's fired or not. So right now the business is executing well. If we keep executing well, we're not going to have a riff. If we don't, then we're going to adjust. And we've always adjusted at Uber in, in a very timely way. All right. You're listening to Uber CEO Dara Khosra Shahi. Uh, you've seen so many economic cycles, Dara. You ran a travel company through 9-11, through the financial crisis. But look, you know, we just saw First Republic sell in a fire sale to J.P. Morgan. How are you thinking about what's ahead? What's your outlook? And, and how, how long does this last? Yeah, I, I could not tell you how long this lasts. But I think as a company, you've got to be prepared. I do think that the cost of capital for the banking system, that tends to be higher leverage, but for the startup ecosystem is getting much more dear. I don't think we are close to the end of that road. I think that rates are going to stay higher for longer because despite people predicting recession and predicting recession, it's not there yet. So I think that companies across the board, whether you're a bank uh, or you're a technology company, you've got to be super conservative as it relates to your balance sheet. You've got to be incredibly disciplined in terms of uh, capital allocation. And I think that environment is going to help the larger global players who are more diversified. And we are exactly that. And that's why you're sh we're showing higher than category growth and much stronger than category margin expansion and now significant free cash flows uh, as well. We think that's a great combination and we're prepared to deliver on that promise whether the environment's strong, medium, or weak. Dara, I went through the earnings transcript with a fine tooth comb. No mention in the prepared remarks, but the first question was about AI. Are you going to accelerate your investments in AI, and are you an AI company? We have been in AI uh, since, since I've been here at the company. Uh, um, you think about our pricing algorithms, uh, routing algorithms, when we decide to let's say, batch a delivery order or not, um, even technologies such as recognition of, uh, of your license or your um, insurance uh, card, et cetera, um, all of these are AI-driven, and they have been a part of how we operate as a company. Uh, what you're seeing now is that as these, these models get more capable and larger, you can train them over much larger data sets. So we would have, let's say, an AI algorithm that is pricing for city by city by city. Now our AI algorithms can price globally, and the efficacy in terms of pricing and matching is incredibly powerful. And because we have more data than anyone else across a multitude of businesses, we think AI is going to be a very, very powerful tailwind for us. Dara, quick yes or no. Are you a chat GPT user? I am a chat GPT user. Um, it's, I'm trying to get better at it. There's a, right. I, I've got, I, my, my skills as a prompt engineer are not what I want them to be. All right, our thanks to Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi and of course, our own Emily Chang. Back to you, Kara. What a great question to ask, like, to leave it on. Ed, we thank you so much. It's time now for some talking tech. We're going to stick with the theme of artificial intelligence. IBM CEO Arvind Krishna says that technology is prompting Big Blue to stop or slow hiring for jobs it believes will be replaced by artificial intelligence. That amounts to, get this, about 30% of its 26,000 workers in non-customer-facing roles. That's over just the next five years alone. And Samsung said this week it would ban employees from using so-called generative AI tools such as ChatGPT. Now, the company is concerned that data sent to AI platforms could be stored on external servers, making it difficult to delete, putting it at risk, being disclosed to other users. Ed, so much more to dig into really the real world impact here of generative AI. We've just been talking about education, the impact there with code.org. We're now looking at how it means for jobs right now. We're thinking about what it means even for those striking in Hollywood. The writers, they're worried about ChatGPT, what it means for their business. You summed it up so well earlier. We're seeing in the markets the impact to the business model and investors recognizing the impact to the business model. Mm. And suddenly pricing it in. The fact that it's a 40% drop in the value of a company such as Chegg, this really is going to upend value overall. Productivity, we hope that that's going to be additive, but it's not going to get away with it without some severe disruption. We're going to talk about that so much more, about generative AI, what it means from an ethical basis as well, and its development. The perfect guest, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, is joining us. That's up next. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. And I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's get straight to these market says because it is an important day from a macro perspective. We are under some significant pressure, not just in the United States in terms of trading, but also Europe closed significantly lower. Canada's on the downside. S&P is currently off by one and a half percent. Tech stocks feeling some of the pain. We go across really to the global macro movers. We don't just look at the, what's happening in equity markets. You look at what's happening in terms of the FX market. We have nervousness around us. We're looking for some sort of haven. So we see like the Canadian dollar, the loony off as oil tumbles. We see that in the commodity sector. Brent crude, WTI crude off by more than 4.8%. Why? We are worried about growth, the jolts data, the softening in the labor market in the US, the focus on the Fed tomorrow, the fact that Chinese manufacturing data is coming in slower than expected. All of this paints a worse macro headwind. I'm looking also at what's happening in terms of sovereign bonds. Phenomenal moves happening at the moment, Ed. US five-year down 17 basis points. Moving on, the individual movers. Amazon actually really the only port of call safety at the moment. Apple on the downside. We're looking at the Golden Dragon. Chinese stocks fall on that manufacturing data in China. And Chegg off by 48%, Ed. Extraordinary. That's an AI impact on the here and now profitability of a business in the education online sector. Yeah, there's a huge discussion to have around artificial intelligence and we welcome now our Bloomberg TV and radio audiences worldwide and bring in Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak active in the field of artificial intelligence added his name to the thousands of signatories of that open letter calling for a six-month pause on training AI systems more powerful than GPT-4 the follow-up to chat GPT to give researchers time to get a better grasp on the technology Steve good morning and welcome uh, thank you. Glad to be here. You're a signatory. Did that effort work? Effort work. Um, are we actually delaying the yes. development of AI? No, you really can't delay the development of technology. And there are people that are motivated for various reasons, largely financial, that are you know going to push it no matter what, and not say, oh, we're we're going to give up the effort you know that we're on and the path we're on. Not really, but. Um, it's, new technology brings the pluses and the minuses, and we're seeing so many examples of that in the news, in presentations that are being made about it. And when new technology brings big changes, sometimes it's be responsible. You know, think about both the pluses and the minuses, because I really fear, I believe more than anything else, the apex of everything that's good in the world is truth. Well, well, and what are the minuses? It. Why did you sign that open letter and petition? Well, um, largely it was, you know what? I'm a human being, and I'm more, less influenced by what I can, things I can read about does this and that examples I'm shown, but by people, certain people that I trusted. And the people I trusted were actually uh, going in this direction, and I wanted to be a part of it. And I do believe just in responsibility. Not that I'm scared of the bad sides of AI, which there are plenty to be shown, or it's going to really be helpful for us, which it is, but it's just... Um, Boy, a new technology you should you know, brings responsibilities. One of the co-signatories was Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk then founded XAI and has been hiring in the field for his own AI startup. Good. Following the petition, what do you make of that? I hope great comes from it. Um, I hope that basically holding it back from being used by bad people or, or just doing bad things on its own because of the influence it gets one's training. I mean, you know, this hallucinogenic and doesn't know what it's doing. I always think of dreams and a lot of the things that comes by there are dreams. They kind of make some sense. They could be partly real, but dreams to me are um, schizophrenia. They talk about hallucinations coming out of AI. Um, schizophrenia, if you had dreams and you thought it was real, you experienced those things in life. In real life, you didn't know it was a dream. That's, what pos that's one possible explanation for schizophrenia. So I'm, um, I'm just, uh, I don't know, I'm just on the side of truth. With the fact that um, the bad people in the world, the ones that want to spam us and get our passwords and take over our lives, they've got a new tool. Steve. And how are they going to be able to use it? And how can you be skeptical when you don't even know if it's coming from AI? Steve, those yeah. uses a phrase, hallucinating. Many say we're making it more powerful. We're encouraging people to think that AI is going to be more terrifying because we keep making it out to be sort of human in this manner. Do we need to change our turn of phrase? Do we need to sort of understand that this, at the end of the day, is still just technology? Oh, no, it's taken us a little further in what we can do as humans. If I'm fed a lot of good source information from AI and I'm a human editor and know how to use it and pass it on, oh, it's given, it's a great tool in our lives, but with a lot of good. Look at the social network and the movie of uh, Social Dilemma and, you know, a lot of good can bring a lot of also bad and being 
uh, tracked and traced and spammed and deceived. What if we had developed the Internet with protocols in place that you could always identify anybody and the spam was almost impossible? Um, what if we have that chance to sit back and think about AI a little before it's here? We don't really have the chance, but um, it's, this, it's that sort of responsibility that I want to take the side of. Steve Wozniak, of course, who is the Apple co-founder for our radio audience and TV audiences. Steve, people have anticipated this coming, not just since November when ChatGPT sort of came into all of our consumer lives, but you've seen round corners when it comes to technology yourself. Why weren't you worrying about this a year ago? Why weren't, wasn't it on ChatGPT GPT version 3 that that started to make it all the more powerful? Mm -hmm. Why now start to go to the administration? Why now start to go to companies to self-regulate? Uh, it's basically based on news cycles. Now, a good five years ago at least, I mean, the book Singularity came out, and I was going around giving speeches for about three years about how um, uh, this new tech, the technology was going to take over the intelligence of humans and really uh, be, be, you know, we'd have companies running with no humans at all. And I backed off of that. You know, I got scared of that. Um, for one thing, it comes out always negative. Okay, technology... AI is going to take care of me so I will have all my food and all my clothing and all my shelter and my kids and my family and, and a lot of entertainment and I'll just be like a family pet, totally taken care of. Sounds like a good thing. So if I'm going to be a pet someday, I thought about it. What do, how do I want to be treated? So that's when I started feeding my dogs filet steaks and <laughs> rotisserie chicken and stuff. No, it's honestly true. And this was a long time ago. For five years, it was a couple of years before I finally switched directions based on what one of my brilliant kids said to me. And you know what? All this great stuff in the world lets us do more as humans. When we founded Apple in those early days, one of my primary purposes was a person is only so capable. Give them the ability to use a computer and they can do more. They can be more in charge of where their life goes and be more capable. So I'm, I'm all for that and I'm for change, but I'm also against things that can be used dishonestly. Like, right. the, like the woman who got a phone call and it was, you know, deep fake. It was her daughter's voice you know, pleading for money. And we, we, you know, some of us have already been hit up in the past with ransomware attacks and all that. Steve, I tweeted that you were coming on the show. A lot of questions from our audience. Thank you for sending those in. Why do we not talk more about Apple and artificial intelligence? <laughs> um, you, you know, I don't know. There's a, uh, I don't know what's going on inside of Apple any more than anyone else. Apple may have some very deep programs going on artificial intelligence. Also, Apple's such a rich company that they kind of look around when there's something that may change the world that we're not developing, uh, we can usually assimilate it. We can, you know, acquire those, those people that are doing that. And, you know, I mean, look at what Microsoft did with uh, OpenAI. Who do you think leads the charge in that respect then? You, you know, Microsoft pretty much put us on the map at the beginning of this year because of the investment additional into OpenAI, yeah. then the integration of OpenAI, do you see mega cap companies leading the way? Oh, I don't try to pick a winner, a loser. Um, the next one round that could come out next week from somebody unknown, and, you know, and be sort of a leader. Um, Chat GPT from OpenAI is really what turned us on into it as people. And you know what? Companies and all that, they don't move ahead because of knowledge. They move ahead because of motivation and emotions. And we should do this. We should do that. And this will fit in with our life and our, and our, our competitors and all that. And AI just comes from stuff that's already been published. They don't create. Creation is the way forward. And they don't really create new stuff. They just apply it, speak it very well, put it all together in a way that makes sense. And a human can use it to move forward and be creative and create new things, new products. Like, when is an AI going to sit down and say, oh, what should I create next that makes sense for the world of people? And it's always going to be, in the end, for people. You know, some people like to say, oh, AI will be the, ahead of us. Yeah. What then, you've almost admitted at the very start of this conversation that it can't be put back in its box. The signing of the letter sort of hasn't done anything to slow the direction of travel and technology. Would you like to see regulation? And is it self-regulation or government regulation? Okay, uh, Mira Mikata, whatever, the uh, CTO of OpenAI and... Uh, uh, and and Jeffrey, um, what's his name, that won the uh, 
the, the Turing Prize, the Nobel Prize in Computer Science, both say, yes, there should be regulation, and we should be very cautious about what's coming, because you don't know how to handle such big change. I'm more worried than anything else about just like the spam and taking advantage of people points of view, the evil use of it. And, um, and uh, I hope we brought attention to the fact that uh, AI has some issues, and uh, I would like to know everything I read. Did it come from AI? Mm -hmm. Then I can be skeptical. And, if, and you know, because I like sureness. I like to read something. I, can I really believe this? I'm already, you know, old enough to be very skeptical anyway. Steve, before we lose you, what do you make of the Apple of 2023, the company that once you founded 30 years ago? Uh -huh. How do you assess its health? Well, I, I don't assess business health. I usually look at products. I know that it's a product line from Apple. It's very good. It's well supported. It's maintained. But I also look at the people that run a company. And, uh, you know, Tim Cook especially has been a long time a favorite of mine because of his cares for diversity among clients and employees and partners. All right. Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, thank you. Now, coming up, Hollywood writers are officially forming a picket line after weeks of negotiations with studios fell through. Next, we'll have more on what the writers are demanding and the role that generative AI plays in Hollywood. This is Bloomberg. Today's going viral, a bit of deja vu for those of us who have perhaps consumed television regularly in the late 2000s. Members of the Writers Guild of America, they're officially on strike again as of this morning. It's the first writer's strike in roughly about 15 years. Bloomberg's Felix Gillette is joining us now for really the impact not only on the media companies, but more broadly, this is going to impact the economy of LA. Remind us why they're striking and why it's so much about streaming. Yeah, it all comes down to these seismic changes in how people have been consuming television and how television is being made as we've switched from this traditional broadcast cable world to the new streaming world. And during that transition, uh, a lot of the ways in which writers were compensated changed. Mm -hmm. And the writers are essentially saying, all of the value that was in the traditional TV market uh, you know, has been stripped out and we're not being fairly compensated. And a lot of that comes down to things like how long seasons are in the streaming world. Um, you know, typically streamers will make eight to 10 episodes for a season of a show as opposed to 20 in the broadcast world. So there's less writers working on a show. Uh, the, there are less seasons typically made. All of that means less money to the writers. Uh, you know, residuals that yeah. were, you know, people, if you had a successful show in the broadcast world, you could live off your residuals for the rest of your life. Streaming, right. all of that has been pretty much stripped out. Felix, artificial intelligence was listed among the concerns and demands. They're yep. not against using chat GPT full stop. There are just some parameters that they want to set. What are they? I think the, the issue is they don't want residuals going to people who created, you know, generative AI to create scripts. Um, and they want some you know, control about how that technology is being employed in the writer's room. Uh, I think a lot of that, again, just comes down to uh, how many writers are working on these shows, how much time they're getting, how the money is carved up. Um, I think that's one of the concerns that's a little bit further out uh, in the future, but definitely on everybody's mind. Right now, I think a lot of it is more you know, sort of prosaic concerns like, you know, how many writers are minimum, uh, you know, for a show that's in pre-development, what's the minimum for the number of writers on a show that's in development, uh, that's been green-led. Uh, so right. those are the issues they're really fighting back and forth on. Felix Gillette, Bloomberg News, thank you so much. Now, coming up, we're going to return to the volatility in the banking system and speak to the CEO of SoFi, Anthony Noto. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Look, 
we're still all thinking about the banking turmoil. It continues today, in particular after the First Republic seizure. As regional banks, they're taking a hit in terms of stock price. We want to talk about well the ecosystem of finance, but also some micro news with the CEO of online lender SoFi. Anthony Noto, he's here, of course. The company just announcing it's partnering with Expedia to bring exclusive travel benefits to its customers. You're thinking about how to set yourself apart from other online lenders, Anthony. But first and foremost, I've got to get your take. What do you make of the financial stability in the US at the moment, the worry over regional lenders? Yeah, I, I'd say what's happening is on the back of the challenges at Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic, um, consumers are really, um, you know, it's a movement to quality. It's a movement to trust. They want to go places that they can trust the brand, trust the company. You know, one of the things that we've seen at SoFi is that our members trust us uh, greatly, not just, just with their checking and savings needs, but their, their needs more broadly, whether it's their credit card or their brokerage account or buying a home or paying for college education or refinancing. We just posted our eighth consecutive quarter of revenue uh, in yesterday with 46% year-over-year growth, $460 million of revenue. Those eight consecutive quarters of record revenue performance reflect the trust uh, and reliability that we're delivering for our members. That yeah. said, we've also continued to increase the benefit that they have. We now provide $2 million of FDIC insurance through a partnership uh, so that not only are we um, providing trust, but we want to continue to increase their reliability um, and the confidence that people have. And that's what, what's leading to such a strong results across the board, both in revenue and, and EBITDA growth, uh, as well as positive margins. But Anthony, they're worried about your forward-looking guidance on EBITDA growth. And is that competition in any way because you have a banking license but a lot of the other online lenders neo banks are doing well with just banking partnerships what do you make of the space you've made for sofi when the market is worried or maybe it's just profit taking uh, we raised our outlook actually we increased our revenue guidance for the year we also increased our ebitda guidance for the year and reinforced our view that we'll be gap profitable by the fourth quarter our bank, which is a subset of our overall uh, company, is already gap profitable. And we had really strong margins there of 20 percent, really strong return on tangible equity of over 20 percent as well. Um, the outperformance that we had in Q1 on revenue, we passed through and raised it for the full year. Um, we also raised EBITDA. We have a lot of leverage in the business. Our incremental margins, which is the, the change in revenue that drops to the bottom line, uh, was 40 uh, plus percent for net income on a gap basis. Uh, and it was also but they are worried about your EBITDA. Yeah, it's growing quite dramatically. We had 16 percent EBITDA margins in the quarter up from 6 percent a year ago. And our EBITDA is now greater than our stock based compensation for the first time. And um, we're on the track to be gap profit by the fourth quarter and uh, generate really strong returns. Anthony, let's go back to the, the travel news. Is this you trying to win business from American Express in, in the chase card business? Yeah, our value proposition is that we want to be there for every one of the major financial decisions in your life and all the decisions in between every day. So we want to help people get their money right by helping them borrow better, save better, invest better, protect and spend better. So this is our first foray into helping people spend better outside of just financial services products. So we launched uh, SoFi Travel with Expedia to give our members great value in their travel choices, great selection, great ease of use, and most importantly, great prices. Prices that are even better when they pay with SoFi and they use their reward points and they actually generate reward points with us. So we're provi providing what they could typically get someplace else at an even better price so they're spending better with us. We'll look to do this in other categories like entertainment um, and, and other types of things like sporting events, et cetera, that are high ticket purchases to give them a better way to buy with a better currency of our reward points and our partners that are providing discounted inventory. Anthony, Bloomberg is tracking closely the litigation against the Biden administration's decision to pause the student loan program. I know that has had some financial impact to you. What's the latest there? Um, what's really happening is in, in the courts, and not, we can't really comment much on it, but it will go through the typical uh, process of the courts with different filings and different motions. You know, we think it's the right thing to do for our country. It obviously is something that would benefit SoFi as a business as well. But I actually think it's the right thing to do for the student loan program. Mm -hmm. College is not going to be free. Um, whether student loans are forgiven, and we're supportive of targeted forgiveness of student loans uh, or not, 
people that are going to college today still have to pay a significant amount of tuition and they're going to need financing. SoFi is one of the companies that can provide that. But there's a number of companies in the ecosystem that haven't been able to withstand what's happened over the last three years and they've dropped out in helping people pay for their college or refinance their college. As I mentioned, we've had eight record quarters of revenue in a row, uh, three record quarters of EBITDA in a row. Our bank is profitable and driving great returns. That said, we'd be doing even better if we could provide our members with the right types of services to pay for their college education or to refinance it. Um, and what the yeah. administration has done is put that on hold uh, without a necess necessary amount of spending, about $5 billion a month that could be better used on people that need it and that are in despair, which is where it should be as opposed to those that can pay. Anthony, 30 seconds, no more. Is it worth the PR hit? Because people say you're just profiteering. Um, doing the right thing, the harder right or the easier wrong is always the way we're going to go. Um, even though it may be viewed and scrutinized, it's the right thing that we needed to do for our company and what we think is the right thing for our country. SoFi CEO Anthony Noto, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very so much. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Caroline. Yeah, you've got so much to catch up on throughout this week. Every day, remember, you can just go and do that. Check out our podcast. What a wealth of CEOs we've had on today. You want to check back into Dara Kososhara. You want to check back into Anthony Noto. You want to hear what's coming from code.org. You go do it on our Spotify accounts, on Apple, on iHeart, wherever you currently consume your audio content. From New York, from San Francisco, on a busy day, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.